Let's course. rock. We're excited. Welcome to this very special episode of More Score and Score the Podcast. Uh, Justin Hurwitz, who we have spoken to before, but also director Damien Chazelle. Uh, Writer-director Damien Chazelle, we're uh, so excited about Babylon. The film is releasing December 23rd. The soundtrack is out now as you're listening to this. And uh, Robert, um, I know you wanted to kick us off with a question. I had an easy question. First of all, lovely (laughs) to see both of you. It's been a minute. Um, And I was trying to remember earlier, and maybe one of you can remind me, one of you reached out to me or sent me Guy and Madeline on a park bench in 2008 or nine. And can you remember in any way, A, who made that connection? B, how stupid I was not to buy stock in Damien Chazelle and Justin Hurwitz at that moment, because I should have. And C, how incredible that there was a, movie made about like all my favorite things musicians and love affairs and my alma mater was representing in the house but how did we connect do either of you remember and if not we can rock on but do you does it anything yeah. ring a bell in that i think that was me i think i sent it knowing that you were the music guy and I think your response, I know your response was never send something that sounds this terrible. Cause it was like a crappy <laughs> MIDI. It was a crappy MIDI demo that I didn't use DAWs at the time. I didn't. Oh, it use- wasn't the movie. It was just no, the music. It was a demo. And I, um, I didn't use DAWs at the time. I used, I orchestrated straight into finale and then listened to the little teeny, you know, MP3s that it would spit out. And I was so proud of it. I was like, hey, you know, this big, you know, music, head of music in Hollywood, I'm going to send this, I'm going to send this demo to. And you listen to it and you're like, never send this kind of thing to anybody. Was I right? You were, yeah, you were right. And then I, uh, it took me a few years, but I eventually had to learn all the software that people had been telling me, you need to learn this stuff. You need to finally kicked you out of your Luddite, your Luddite. uh, Oh, that's funny. Damien, so you heard um those demos and did it ever occur to you this sounds shitty or did you say i totally understand where he's going it doesn't matter because when you're having the communication that you two have you don't get a real trumpet player you just i got it yeah it sounded great to me i think uh no yeah but i remember yeah we did send you the movie it just was it just had it just didn't have we hadn't done the the real score yet so it was it was all demo music on it so you got kind of a rough cut of the movie with this really bad sounding midi version of the score which again i i I thought you know would still i think i was completely in favor of sending it to you as well but i remember your response it was exactly what justin that's really first of all incredibly cruel of me no but you also said some kind things you said you said that you liked the um the um the, the I think the overall vibe. I think. Oh yeah, you liked the 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 Jason Palmer who who is the lead in it. So so you had some kind things to say about the actors. Nothing um, to say about Justin, but that's okay. <laughs> first of all, it's really there's there's too much for us to share and not pertinent to this conversation about Babylon. But there's so much in this story um, about Hollywood that's really interesting. Number one, it's not about what it's about. I may have been having a really difficult day on, you know, like Planet of the Apes 9 and you and I got your thing was kind of had lost all ability to be polite and just said, you know, dudes, come on. But um, forgive me. I hope I I need to ask your forgiveness because I, I missed a bet because the next thing that happened is you made whiplash. And uh, it was like you made what? Whiplash, you made La La Land, which are two m- m- musical. Speaking of how just yeah. music works in movies, are t- totally unique. Um, they've stood out to me for a long time. Espe- like the the end of Whiplash, especially, is just such a. I, I mean, you've heard this a thousand times, but such an incredible musical way that it's propelling the storytelling. Um, but it's all throughout La La Land. We, I got married and we played La La Land all throughout the, the, the wedding. So it's very personal to me. Tell me about how you started thinking about how music would function. I know you start very early. You guys both start discussing things early. But when did it start for Babylon? 
I mean, as early as we can, really. Damien sent me the script in fall of 19, which, I don't know, Damien, was that kind of your first presentable draft? Was that sort of when the producers oh, yeah. got it? Yeah, I mean, even, yeah, right, exactly. Right right around when the producers got it. But before, before we kind of tried getting, you know, sending it to studios or anything like that, I think it was, yeah. Hmm. Um, so that's it, truly at the beginning of this pipeline. Yeah. 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 It was, some, it was sometime, I think it was even a little before fall 2019, probably when I first sent it to, to Joy, but it was sometime in 2019. Yeah. Well, that's when, I, that's when I started, uh, that's when I sort of dove in, but, um, did you send him some MIDI demos? Sorry. Go ahead, no. please. Don't let me interrupt. <laughs> Nobody does. Uh, I mean, uh, well, he does piano demos and then, um, and then, uh, I mean, yeah, it, right. That they are MIDI uh, eventually, but they, they just, they're better MIDI. When you yeah, get a script not, from Damien, does it say music here? I mean, in other words, do you sort of spot a script or do you talk about it? How do you approach the collaboration? Well, I think it's um, it's a mix because I think certainly like in a movie like Babylon, for instance, there's a lot of instances of on screen music. So those are specified in the script. But uh, but then and some of the underscore actually is specified for certain of the montages and things like that, for instance. So there's a fair amount of kind of specifying. But it's very it, it, like you said, it's very it's not like real description of what the music will be. It's just, you know, music here. Um, but, but you know, so then that, I think that gives Justin a place to start from, but that's also only a sliver of the ultimate amount of music that the overall film will need. But at least, at least it kind of gives them a starting point, I think. And we had to go through and talk about where, even with the performance stuff, like where it was performance and where we would keep it going. Because a lot of times I remember it wasn't so obvious in the script where you wanted to keep that same music going as we were cutting away to different... Yeah different scenes or different, um, you know, different parts of a sequence. Scorse, you know the word? It was the <laughs> Cop Coppola's word, and that there's a lot of it in Babylon, where yeah. source yep. becomes score, and uh, I mean, how much can you do? First of all, it's music wall-to-wall. -wall. It's a phenomenal achievement, what you've done musically. It's, Thank you. It is just so musical. And for those of us that love musical movies, it's just triumphant amount of music and interesting. I you know I listened. Well, can I go off of that, Robert? Yeah. Because what I want to ask, part of the reason that, Justin, you come in so early, and I'm curious, both of your impression on this, what is it that music can help inform at that early stage of a story? Because I'm sure you're going to get notes from everybody and their mother and, you know, their friend. Um, but obviously you want music to be able to contribute to something to the story i i imagine that that's because you want to be able to find a little bit of a momentum early on that can exist even before the music exists but what, what what's the reason that music is is such an early thought yeah i mean when when there's a character who plays an instrument like in this movie or other movies we've made obviously then it's a there's a very you know important narrative purpose but um when it comes to the sort of the other uses of music i love the way that in so many of damien's movies and so many of the parts of the movies music and picture are really so symbiotic so even things that are not performances i remember he was storyboarding sequences like um i won't i don't think this is an important super important story point to get away but manny racing in a car to he has to get a camera and um love that, that was that was all like highly storyboarded. So I was working on a demo and uh, Damien was making like hand drawn storyboards and cutting an animatic together. And I was, you know, struck shaping, shaping the demo to fit the storyboards. And he was trimming and shaping the storyboards to fit the demo. And both of them were coming together at the same time so that that sequence could be very musical you know the music would fit and the picture would fit and it could all be very rhythmic you know it could end the sequence would end right on right on the downbeat and the whole sequence would just kind of uh picture and music would would just fit like a glove is that one of the singles the uh, score to that manny's it's like the track. cousin it's like the cousin of that of that track so the one we released was call me manny um this other one is called Herman's Hustle, if that sounds familiar, there was a track in La Land called Herman's Habit, because my grandfather was a sax player, like a really great sax player. It's, I think, why my sister and I became, went into music professionally. But uh, anyway, so I've been naming uh, tracks with saxophone after my grandfather, uh, who I never oh, knew. so great. 
who I never really knew. But anyway, uh, so anyway, Herman's Hustle, you guys will hear. That's the track that I was developing and Damien was sort of storyboarding and one of many tracks that we were creating an animatic at the same time that I was demoing. So in a sense, it's almost with the storyboard kind of pass of this and music for the storyboard, you're almost constructing an early version of the entire score. Like it, it beyond just kind of sketches of ideas, but it's it's more than building blocks because you can start to anticipate what timing and I guess other things that m maybe inform how it's then shot later on. Is that correct? Yeah, not for the whole score. I mean, there are plenty of cues where I have to watch the scene. Like any composer, you watch the scene and you sort of feel what it wants to be. But for a number of sequences um, in this movie, yeah, they Damien knew he wanted it to be very rhythmic and we started figuring out what that music would be before the movie was shot. Damien, have you ever shot a scene in Babylon with music in your ears that had been written for that scene? Kind of the couple directors yeah. asked their composer to give them a vibe. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean I've mean, i done that at this point with, uh, on all the movies. Um, mm. uh, so, you know, even First Man, even though there's no, we didn't really need music, uh, because uh, there's no source music there. Um, I, I, I sort of find it so helpful as soon as possible to just get some sense of what the key, for me, I guess it's just figuring out what what, what, what the theme is or what the themes uh, are uh, musically, what, what that key melody or soundscape or whatever it is, uh, harmony, whatever it's going to be that kind of defines or helps define or crystallize the sound of the movie, what that's going to be. Um, and so in First Man, it was the sort of main melody on Theremin. I just kind of had that. And sometimes I play that during the shoot. Um, on, on Babylon, it was sort of a mix, again, of, in that case, a lot of the on-screen music, which we needed to play anyway. But then there would be um, just, you know, things for, for instance, even just, you know, scenes of of Manny and, and Nelly, uh, uh, Margot's character, talking or interacting, you know, where there was just a certain kind of energy needed and 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 um uh, a certain kind of musical momentum needed that might not even wind up being what's used in the cut uh, on film but just uh you know to get you into the scene to get the actors into the scene would be would be so they know, would hear it as well i mean uh, yeah initially we wouldn't uh, you know it's you have to be you know uh, you want to not sort of uh, it's one of the challenges of w w why sometimes i wish we could just shoot silent movies again because uh uh, you, you want to not totally corrupt production sound as much as possible. Yeah. So whenever, whenever you don't care about production sound, it's, you know, like dance numbers or big sort of battlefield things, then it's great to just sort of blast a uh, live <laughs> on set. Yeah. I love that. Um, otherwise, you know, you kind of do it a little bit, stop and start uh, uh, or in between takes or things like that. And in, in the case also of this movie, I had done a lot of rehearsals just with the actors Um you know, on my iPhone and stuff of various, yeah, you know, basically all the scenes in the movie I'd wound up um, rehearsing at least at least all the scenes with Diego Calva who plays Manny because he was a relatively Incredible. new. Incredible! What a movie star! Oh yeah, well, he, I mean, he was it, it was uh, it was a very lucky find, and it was um, but it was kind of but it's sort of figuring out the character with him through rehearsal, and then I would kind of you know I'd shoot on my iPhone, I'd cut it together, and I'd use Justin's score, you know. Um, uh, you know, or demos of score um, and, you know, sort of set them against scenes and things like that. So there was kind of this working version of, you know, sort of iPhone version of the movie with, uh, mm. with music already where, and you, you know, so that kind of gives you a sense too of like, okay, this is really vibing. This is great. This is the sort of language of the movie here. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe this is, you know, one of the cues that Justin has done, maybe it doesn't work so well in this part of the movie, we can appropriate it somewhere else. Or, you know, you kind of see what, what falls and what rises through that process. Um, I ask all, all that about the about the trumpet player and that process. Um, yeah, I kind of read before today about him as much as I could. It was hard to figure out. So correct me if I miss something. Was he a trumpet player before the show? Before you shot it, and in this very process, did he have an earwig and he played along to something Justin you'd pre-recorded? Those scenes always fascinate me, music scenes in your movies and how you do them. Well, the reason you have a hard time figuring out the the uh, his backstory is because, uh, and he, he'll now joke about this, Jovan, he did the classic actor thing, which is uh, just, 
if they ask you if you can do it, just say you can. So he, <laughs> he, he did an amazing audition uh, for the role that was just, I mean, he's just a, just one of the best actors I've ever worked with. And it was one of those, mm. one of the, one of those auditions where it's just kind of immediately like, okay, this, this, this is the guy, except I'd been very adamant for my own kind of peace of mind that I only wanted to look at people who already played trumpet. They didn't have to be Miles Davis, but they just had to really at least, you know, have a handle on the instrument. Um, and, uh, uh, and so he had this great, you know, this great audition comes in and I knew some of his work from earlier movies as well. So I was excited and I was like, oh, I didn't know he's a trumpet. And so he really plays trumpet. Oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, plays trumpet. Yep, yeah, 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 yeah. He's been playing all his life. And lo and behold, he'd like picked it up for like one afternoon in third grade or something. That was his playing trumpet. Of course. But, uh, but he uh, but he wound up doubling down and and um, and practicing his head off and uh, um and uh, yeah, and then and then exactly, we we got him a trumpet. We got him the actual trumpet that he'd be playing on set to practice to to really get to know mm -hmm. that. And and then he would have earwigs, or again, we'd be playing live um, live playback on set, and he'd be playing along to it. Um, I mean, Justin can speak more to that to the the shooting of it, but um, yeah, Justin, I was really interested in the melodies he played because this is a little inside baseball, but. Sometimes you hear a movie that's about the 20s and they're playing bebop and flecked licks and I want to yell in the middle of the theater. No, dude, it's, you're, you're 20 years too early. What do you, And you didn't. And I really appreciate that. It wasn't bop. It wasn't jazz that showed up later in history. And a lot of people don't understand that. Was that conscious? Was I kind of overexcited about how you articulated the music in a way that wasn't postmodern in obvious ways. That was what was so cool. It's a complicated question, but yeah, you understand my drift there. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we did twenties jazz, but you're also no, not right. at all. We didn't do that kind of familiar bop that you also hear. You know, just as a placeholder for all jazz. You know, this is what jazz sounds like, at least in movies. Um, so yeah, we were trying to be just kind of create our own world a little bit um, to be definitely more wild, more unhinged, more aggressive in a lot of these tracks than anything we know of being in the twenties. Um, an idea Damien told me early on, which I thought was uh, kind of inspiring was that in his research, he found that th the music that was recorded in the twenties that we've heard because it was recorded is really just a small sliver of what was actually played in the twenties. Um, and there was a underground music scene. There were all sorts of musicians doing very interesting things um, that just never had the opportunity to go into the studio and lay it down. So we thought, um, well, at a super drug fueled party full of wild people and a wild band going off the rails, what could that be? What could that sound like? And um whether or not that's what was any, anything that was actually played. We just sort of, he, Damien created a, a world. He created a very entertaining and, and wild world. And, and we were trying to create music that would go along with that. And I can, the four on the floor aspect of finding that underneath mm -hmm. a kind There's of a, 20s vibe. So it feels contemporary instantly. For sure. There's a lot of modern dance influence for on the floor. Like you talk about that sort of pounding kick drum, which I sweetened with a little 808 to give it even more nice. room. There's, you know, dance hi-hat, which you definitely didn't have back then, but it still gave you that sort of really fun dance. Um, you know, everybody on amphetamines feel, um, when that, when that was the, right for the scene. Um, there were certain structural things that I got inspired by modern dance, you know, with risers and drops and those moments that sort of build anticipation and then really deliver that dance moment. Um, there, and then there were a lot of rock and roll influences. Something Damien and I talked about a lot was like, what would it feel like if we had riffs, really riff based jazz, the kind of riffs mm. that could be on an electric guitar, but you do it with unison horns, you do it with a horn section it would be very muscular. And that's also not really 20s jazz as far as we know, but it still gave you that feel, that kind of rock and roll aggressive feel, but it was using the instrumentation of a band from the time. So it was kind of a little bit there and a little bit something else. The uh, three years basically to work on the music for this, um, how much did the music change throughout that 
that period of time, the way you were thinking about it, or was, was it continuing to evolve? I know deadlines can sometimes be scary if they're too tight, but also there's the flip side, which is if you have such a long runway to be thinking about things, you inevitably start to think, oh, well, maybe I should do this instead. Uh, how much did it change throughout the process? Most of the tunes were locked in before we shot. I mean, we had really identified all this, all the set pieces, all that was done. And then we used most of those same tunes as either those spilled over into score or we use them as, as purely score cues. So a lot of that, like the major DNA was there, but the experimentation and recording never stopped to the point that I was we were on the dub stage and I was still bringing in new musicians and, and getting more options and more layers and more solos and more tr trying things up until the very, very end, basically until they said, you have to be done. P past when they said you had, uh, you had to be done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Damien smiling. <laughs> people not super happy with me at one point, but. They only, Damien, they, what, yeah. what directors, I mean, I imagine you're aware of how your musicality is rare. I mean, I, having the great privilege of working with a lot of directors, it's insane how few of them understand music and s other than, I don't know, man, that, what is that? A clarinet? Do we have, I don't like clarinets, you know, all that silly stuff that really happens. And then you, you get to you or Ang Lee. I mean, you are two directors who really understand what's happening and get so deeply involved i kind of wonder do you think about a picture from the music up before the story everything you've done is is around music the mm -hmm. first man not so much but well do you do you write to music yeah i mean how what is that process it's so different from other directors yeah i um i think i just find music so helpful again to crystallize a mood you know of some kind of a some kind of a some kind of an emotion that i want something to convey and and uh you know it's it's uh and it can be so simple that it that, that it sort of again can hinge on just a single melody or single sort of sound you know um uh with you know with la la land it, it, i mean it's again going back you know with whiplash it was it was uh it, in that case it started with the sound of pieces that i played as a drummer kind of uh, uh coming up when i was younger and a certain kind of polyrhythmic you know 70s big band jazz intensity mm -hmm. that just was sort of um this kind of felt like this angular violent approach to music that mm -hmm. um that felt like that was going to be the music for the boxing version of a music movie. Um, La La Land, it was, it was Justin and I just shared this love for kind of French melodies that sort of uh, mm. meld happy and sad in, in one, in one cadence, you know? So it was just like, it was that. Um, first Man, it was the idea of, could there be some kind of sound that would communicate grief across the cosmos? And that's where the idea of, the theremin or something you know some kind of melody played plaintively like that that felt like feels like you're hearing someone singing from a billion miles away and it's kind of refracted through space mm -hmm. um and babylon it was a party babylon you know ultimately and 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 trying to then kind of define well what is a party a party is both the exuberant youthful innocent joyfulness of the uh initial throw of the party it's also the time at the party you know two-thirds in where it starts to get a little ugly and then it's the aftermath of the party, which can be both sad, but also maybe bittersweet. There can be a beauty to it. When the dawn starts to come in, there can be a melancholy because you got to get back to life. There can be a sense of loss, a sense of hope. Um, so that whole thing, you know, we, I think we talked a lot about Fellini and, you know, Rhoda. We talked a lot about... Um, I thought exactly the same. And they actually, Rhoda would write for Fellini before they shot. Right, which and that was something I'd read about too. You know, it's it's sort of, uh, and you get that sense from Fellini movies and a lot of those Italian movies that would post sync. You know, where they play sound on set, even though they're quote sound movies. Uh, sorry, not sound on set, um, music on set, and they just the camera feels like it's dancing. You know, so I think that the the actors feel like they're dancing even when they're walking. So I think that idea with this movie of that that even when we're not in a party scene it should feel like a party, which again, doesn't mean that it's always just balls to the wall, you know, 808s and, and, and dance beats, but it should be 
it should we should be going through some part of the stages up and down of a party and that's kind of that that the the idea of the of a party as a living organism that goes through a life cycle that that needed to be really the dna of the movie and 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 of course you can't define a party without music so i think it was it, it was it was also sort of clear bo to both of us early on that even more so than some of the previous movies we had done music was just going to be um it was kind of going to be the only way to really crystallize the movie because there's so many storylines so many characters so many incidents it spans over so many years it's this sprawling kind of morass of a movie uh that's trying to kind of take in a whole society in one grasp um so the music was going to be the one thing that could actually unify it and crystallize it and give it a singular identity um and uh yeah so um it kind of felt even more crucial on this one maybe than on previous ones if that makes sense can i ask from a writing perspective um is it intimidating to dive back into an era that there, I mean, it's Hollywood. So we have some, we have some things from, from the era, but um, yeah, I, I wrote a, a podcast called blockbuster that was set in the 1970s. We have lots of video of the 1970s, you know, like there's, there are plenty of ways for us to get to, to things like that in the 1920s, as uh, Justin already mentioned, there's a lot of music that, maybe wasn't ever recorded. You know, there, there are things, maybe there's some sheet music someplace, maybe someone scribbled some notes someplace, but what's the research like to try to make, you know, the 1920s feel authentic, given that this is still, you're still, you know, putting, you know, your, your kind of unique uh, storytelling on it, but you want it to feel of the era. Is it hard to do that with something that's this far back? It is. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, there's definitely that thing of the further back you go, the, the, the more the more you have to sort of recreate i i think um the added challenge with this was that even though it's far back the 1920s I, somehow for whatever reason we today have such a clear vision in our head of what mm -hmm. the 1920s are supposed to be what we think they were and i think justin and i both were just we were definitely not interested in just adding more fuel to that we wanted to just completely uh try to try to sort of demolish all those preconceptions try to just go against them so um the same way we knew certain musical things were not going to appear in the movie certain visual things were not going to appear or they would be used as counterpoint so you know bobbed haircuts flapper dresses you know people holding martini glasses doing the charleston like that stuff was either not going to be seen in this movie because you've seen it too many times before and it's cliche nice. or it was going to be used as a counterpoint to kind of show how out of sorts out of um you know how how uh misfit our characters were you know for instance sometimes margot kind of winds up we, we would sort of joke that sometimes you know like there's a scene later in the movie where margot winds up at this very kind of rich person party where everyone's in tuxedos and hors d'oeuvres and stuff that they are need to feel a little bit like um some kind of you know wild animal from the future has stumbled into a 1920s movie and needs to kind of suddenly play the part and can't you know, so using the expectations of the period a little bit to subvert um, the rest of it, you know, that that was kind of part of the game. So it meant, you know, but I still wanted everything to feel authentic and everything to, uh, I guess, be, be authentic. So it all had to stem from research. So it wound up basically being uh, the, 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 the sort of the rule became find, you know, anytime we found a photograph or a piece of documentary evidence of something that surprised us, that did not feel like what we thought the 20s would feel like. Any photograph of long, wild hair, any photograph of, uh, you know, a, a type of outfit that felt really, would feel scandalous even in the 60s, and you'd never think someone in the 20s would be wearing it, but these would be photographs from the 20s. Anytime mm -hmm. we found something like that, those would become, you know, our kind of golden references and we'd sort of build build upon them and so we had kind of ultimately between me and costumes and sets and camera and extras casting we we had a sort of binder of all the reference images that we that we that we liked and it was always with that sort of common commonality of things from the era that are accurate to the era but that are not what you expect from the era that are shocking it, it's like fabulous to hear this i must confess i just finished kiki man ray it's a new book about kiki oh. montparnasse do you know the story I, and i i i mean i i know more the man ray side of it but that's i didn't know there is this a new book about a new about brand new book about kiki of montparnasse and of awesome. course we both maybe know the man ray story for the same reason because we grew up in princeton and i was close to do you know the princeton connection to man ray i don't know the prince i know yeah no i more know the like the french you know the french paris Right. Oh, there's a very deep Prince connection to Man Ray. I, I knew him when I was eight years old. 
he he came his niece knew him yeah his niece and i went to stay with wow. him in paris something i really? yes I when he was, i'm like uh yeah but all i was uh he his man. niece lived um on drake's corner road in princeton and was we were very close and to Ray that family. lived in princeton correct what naomi, was man ray like naomi savage man ray was awesome man ray was <laughs> awesome was. man ray you will both enjoy this and i i diverge but when i was in france with man ray as a 19 year old sophomore at our alma mater man ray would have me open his mail for him and i remember opening a letter from a junior at tufts saying dear mr ray I'm doing a thesis on you. Would you sign this three by five card enclosed so I can put it in my thesis? And he kind of gave it back to me next. You know, <laughs> I, I thought, oh, that's really close to kind of my whole life. Somebody doing that. It was so perfect. Um, but the reason I mention it is in the book, Kiki Man Ray, the really great story of Man Ray's mistress, the twenties are also incredibly present mm. incredibly modern mm -hmm. a real reaction to the ghastly event that the world had just been yeah. through yeah. which you know the war to end all wars yeah. and i thought of it i thought of two things watching babylon one was wow paris was also just cocaine and absinthe and you know kiki walking into a bar where somebody had a snake around their neck and a live fox and you know shit that was just we thought we were being freaky in the 80s and 90s and <laughs> they were original hipsters yeah <laughs> and i think hollywood and but also it's interesting that you describe the rhythm of a party in babylon because there was another thought i had during babylon which is i don't know if you what you would think about this either of you there was a certain there's a certain desperation at a party like i don't want to go back to real life i don't want this party to end can i get any higher can i can i disappear from life in this party because when the sun does come up i'm back to ordinary life and during those frenetic scenes in babylon i had this feeling of it's kind I've been to some wild parties. Maybe all of us have. You're you're away from life mm -hmm. for a moment. Was that a goal of those? I mean, those parties are un. I want to go to one of those parties. It's just leave it right there. I would like to go, particularly if Margot Robbie is actually there. But those party scenes, where did you shoot them? I mean, I've asked you twelve questions at once, but I'm so fascinated by those party scenes. Were they shot here in California? Yes, yeah, they're they they're, they're all shot in in LA or the LA you know greater LA area. Um, sometimes out in the out in kind of the hinterlands, you know, out in right. sort of closer to Justin. Lincoln. Were you on set for a lot of that? Yeah, for any scenes that had music in them. And how long would it take for? I mean, I don't know either the part the party with the tuxedos where she goes wild animal. Is that a couple days a week? That's two days, that was, right? That was uh, two days, yeah. That was a very tight two days of shooting at Busby Berkeley's old house. Funny Come enough. on. Yeah. Which is, what a uh, ghost. Ne next door to Fatty Arbuckles. So, oh, my God. Great ghosts of the... I know, I know. But, but, uh, um, but I, I also just... Uh, going back to what you were saying about like, or, you know, Paris Man Ray, the 20s, it just reminds me of like that. I think that was part of the that was part of the thing too for all of us was just that that it, the the 20s i think have gotten this at least in america we, we have this sort of conception in our heads where it, you know that people had a good time but we've i think we've lost sight of just how radical and wild and anarchic and dangerous and just sort of rules busting the the time was we sort of it's just like you i think we i think i initially and we all sort of had this have this kind of sense in our head of recent history where where you know a certain kind of drug use or sexual freedom or whatnot didn't really come into being in a way that we would identify as really out there until the 70s or 80s or whatnot and um but then you sort of i mean yeah you, you read about man ray in paris you read 
you read Henry Miller, you know, he's writing in the thirties, but he's talking about the twenties, uh, you know, it, also in Paris, you, you, you look at, uh, you look at stories like Fatty Arbuckle's story or Louise Brooks. Yeah. Whatnot yeah. And Hollywood. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, and it's exactly like what you were saying, like the, 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 the ways that pe- the extremes people would go, this desperation to, which it's a desperation to escape that makes sense if you're coming off of World War One, if you're coming off of the Spanish flu, if you're coming off, I mean, it's just, this was a, a generation that had been just completely, had gone through apocalypse, basically. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, it almost makes sense that in reaction to that, they would just be like, well, fuck it, you know, life is short anyway. Um, uh, it's all kind of meaningless anyway uh you know any moment you could just go into a trench and and be you know shot for no reason you know so we might as well just uh make the most of every moment there's some kind of a reckless debaucherous desperation hysteria that comes out of that that i think is found obviously in paris but also found more indirectly in la at the time and in this kind of hive of artists who are making an art form that isn't considered an art form it's considered vulgar anyway and so they're kind of left to their own devices and they do their own thing and that can't last. Eventually that does change. Eventually all of that calms down and real life intrudes and, you know, uh, the society has to quote, grow up for better or worse, but there's a moment there where it's just unhinged. And, uh, that's the moment that we really wanted to try to do justice to in a way that it felt like earlier depictions of the twenties hadn't. I wonder back to the, uh, the life cycle of a party. Yeah. We have that moment where, like you said, Robert, you don't want to leave and you just want to party as hard as you can. Mm-hmm. So we have, Music wise, we have that music getting as close to going off the rails as possible. But then we also have, like you mentioned, that aftermath phase, which um, we tried to also address. So there's this one track at that opening party um, that happens the morning after. When they're out in the, there's a a crane shot. Yeah. O- over the driveway, whatever yep. you yeah. call it. Well, there's, it's the queue. Yeah. It's the queue right before that, but they kind of go into each other. Um, it's called, people will see on the album, it's called Gold Coast Rhythm Wallach Party. And mm-hmm. it was, we, we, we created it to be the, um, you know, the morning after queue. And I mocked it up and it was this sort of sweet, wistful, hopeful queue with all this counterpoint, all the music, all the instruments taking, uh, taking their moment. And we recorded it. We were at Capitol recording it with a, with a small band. And it was really pretty. And I was really happy. We finished like a f- first one, two, three takes. And it sounded really good to me. And Damien was like, okay, but can we play it hungover? And 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 I was and I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, but you have to keep in mind that everybody is either still drunk or hungover. You know, half the people, most of the people in this room are passed out. The music needs to reflect that. So... We then had to start doing take after take where we're telling the musicians, okay, can you play like a little out of tune? Can you play like way off the beat? Can you be sort of barely conscious while you're playing? And and then had to calibrate what that is because the first instincts was to just slide all over the place and it, sound, it sounded like a cartoon. And then we had to refine what just, you know, sluggish and a bit out of it would sound like. Um, so that was that was a really fun uh, is, is fun moment. There did I just realize accidentally that the Wallach has any relation to DA? Oh my! I forgot you know DA. Of course. I mean, I, I mean, you know, not not relation. I would say, but it's right. just Wallach is a great name that I probably wouldn't have thought of on my own if I didn't know DA Wallach. It's just a great name. I have. I have. Uh... It sounded like a studio mogul's name. It's, it does, and it never occurred to me, but Chester, <laughs> Chester French also. I wonder if I was more polite. I don't think I was actually more polite to Chester French when they showed up. I probably said, your demos need help, too, and then they got signed to Interscope. I have one more. We're, we're out of time, but I, I personally want to ask both of your opinion about this topic we just got off of, which is you said at one point, Damien, that you know, art grew up and the society, you know, in some ways it got it gets commodified. And you think about how in the twenties, Mann and Marcel Duchamp and all of them, the artists, you know, that Dada comes out of that sense of, and I I don't know if there's a new relation to Babylon's moment with a kind of reaction, but why don't we do that now? We're living in a similarly insane time. Do artists today 
respond with Dada in any way that you can identify to the trauma of today. It's a not a very well asked question, but as artists, I'd like to hear from both of you. Are we all so commodified that we don't break out and do something like Man Ray would and put nails on the bottom of an iron or, you know, an eye on a metronome? Or is there room for that kind of art? And are you both going to make a fabulous art film next that makes no sense and is like Andy Warhol, eight <laughs> hours of people sleeping? Your thoughts on art in a traumatic era, and does Babylon reflect it? That's my question. Um, it's a good question. I I, I think, um, yeah, I have a very hard time, I think, uh, answering beyond my own sort of little limited bubble when it comes to sort of the broader world of art today and 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 whatnot i i I, um i think that i think i do you know it does feel on a certain level like like uh um at least again speaking from my bubble in hollywood that that we sort of you know the, the sort of artists there um there's a lot of fearfulness there's a lot of you know we're sort of uh this this kind of the climate feels like uh, you're sort of waiting for the bottom to fall out. There's fear about the future of cinema. There's fear about the future of, you know, what is art in today's age? You know, it's sort of the questions you're asking in a way. Is art so commodified that is art even a thing anymore? Is, you know, is, is, is um, these kind of existential, you know, questions of existential dread. Um, and so in some ways for me, I think, you know, the more that I w- would kind of be working on this movie for the past number of years and sort of diving into about exactly 100 years ago, you know, give or take, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in some ways, the more comfort I would get out of it, if it, it, it you know, if that doesn't sound too perverse, out of the idea that um, that clearly somehow cinema, art in general, survived, responded, adapted um thrived you know I, I i i think for instance uh for me you know i relate a lot to filmmakers who maybe felt caught in the middle when sound started coming in and they sort mm. of they, they learned how to make film a certain way and suddenly they have to adapt to it and many of them felt that the art form had been um irretrievably destroyed you know and would never really would never recover that um that cinema was a silent art form it was music and image um in some ways that's still kind of an opinion even though i wasn't even born at the time that i share so i can really empathize with it um it's maybe part of why i try to always make whatever excuse i can to wind up in a place with justin where it can just be music and image um and sort of pure cinema in in that sense um but at the same time uh, i'm not going to argue looking back that 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 cinema did die, that nothing great was done in the sound era, that, you know, everything worthwhile doing in cinema was done by 1929 and everything since then has been shit. I don't feel, I don't share that view at all either. So there's a certain kind of comfort I get from looking at the, you know, people worried that the sky is falling at that moment, which it very well may have been for them at that moment. It's not to, it's not to belittle that Um, it was cataclysmic, but to kind of know that there was, a rebound there was some kind of adaptation some kind of recovery um after it i think the sort of bigger message for me is just that art goes on you know art lives on and it's bigger than any one of us and it's bigger than any one career or any one town and it just uh, or even any one medium and it it survives sometimes not in ways that we could predict but um it's not going away well you've made a historic film i know that our time yeah. is is limited and uh will contribute to the history of art and cinema and absolutely a uh, director and composer it's epic. so special that you can be on the same page and be working across different films and be just kind of vibing in the storytelling so thank you both for uh for chatting damien chazelle justin Hurwitz, on this special edition of uh more score and score the and podcast allowing us to babble on <laughs> oh nice <laughs> you're gonna hear that a lot yeah <laughs> if you haven't already all right thank you guys first Thank you. Nice seeing you, Robert. Thank you, Matt. Same. See you. Cheers. Bye.